bow our heads please in prayer dear heavenly father we are so grateful that you have allowed us to come to this place at this present time we give you praise and honor for allowing us to be in your presence bless this assembly the meeting and let it proceed decently and in order and we thank you for your grace and your mercy we ask your continued blessings in the name of jesus Amen. Yes, Mayor Blake. Present, ma'am. Deputy Mayor Hearn. Present. Councilmember Dial. Here. Councilmember Goins. Here. Councilmember Koss. Here. City Attorney Garganisi. Here. And City Manager Witten. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, proceeding on with tonight's event, please, ma'am, please, sir. Um, <clears throat> I would like to make an uh, amendment for tonight's meeting on our agenda. <clears throat> so, yes, sir. <coughs> Item number 2-2, under awards and presentation, a proclamation from Government Finance Professional Week, I think will be presented by Mrs. Rebecca Bowman. And I think this shall conclude this portion. We did receive some uh, a notification from um, Chief Evander Collier the uh, pertaining to consent Agenda item, is that correct, uh, Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. Thank you, Kyla, ma'am. And he's going to read some things into the minutes as well. So, item number 2-1, I made a motion for to amend the agenda to reflect for the regular meeting on March the 14th, 2023. And chair is looking for a second. Second. We got a second on the floor by uh, Councilman Gorns. Chair is going to call the question all in favor saying aye. 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 And the nays, ayes have it unanimously. Proceeding on to the next item, number 2-2, regular meeting of January the 10th, 2023. Also regular meeting of February the 14th, 2023. What are the wishes of council? Motion to approve. We have a motion on the floor by Deputy Mayor Hearn. Second. Second by Councilman Dow. Judge going to call the question. All in favor by saying aye. 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 And the nays, ayes have it unanimously. Proceeding on to presentations uh, and awards, item number 3-1. We have one of our very own, homegrown. Uh, a few things I would like to acknowledge about this young man. The Honorable Nina J. Dunn. He's been a professional uh, officiating scout for the Pac-12. I even recall seeing him officiating a game for the SEC. I mean, he has a long life legacy. He's a pillar of the community, a product of Coco. He's also a graduate of Coco High School, became an administrator, principal at um, Ronald McNair Middle School, where it was a prominent A school for a multitude of years, consistently. Um, we're recognizing him for his commitment for higher education. His professional degree in reference of NFL officiating, the first from Copa High School, I'm happy to say, but also his commitment to just fulfilling the lives of 
many students that the hearts that he touched. So without further ado, we would like to bring uh, Mr. Lee McDonald. Would you come forward, please? And let's bring him on. We would like to present him with the key to the city of Cocoa. I'm asking staff and council. Please come forward. Let's bring him on with a round of applause, please. This is the name of the city called Trey Blake. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Do I need a microphone? No. 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 Okay, cool beans, cool beans. Uh, but let me say, first of all, I have on my orange and black because Mr. Dunn is an orange and black young man. He's accomplished many great things in the Var County. He was the first, like I stated earlier, uh, NFL referee from the great city of Coco. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. And he graduated from my or our alumni, South Carolina State University. So I have my shoes on. Uh, Coach Goins is old hell wildcat, so we played against them on a multitude of occasions. And uh, uh, Mr. Dunn, sir, did, during your tenure playing at South Carolina State, sir, um, did you play against Bethune Cookman Wildcats? Many times. Many times. And uh, let me assume this. You were victorious every time. I'm pretty much, is that a safe? Correct. Okay. All right. <laughs> now you see, because of his leadership as an educator, a principal for how many years, Mr. Dunn? Uh, principal. Principal. Ten years at McNair. Ten years at McNair. And throughout those ten years, I'm willing to bet all my Social Security check that the super majority of them A school, and I'm very proud of that. Let's give him a round of applause, <laughs> He's a product of Cocoa High School. Prior to attending Cocoa High School, Mr. Dunn, you attended which middle school, sir? Uh, I went to Kennedy Middle. Kennedy Panthers, so did I. So you see what I'm saying to you? I'm following his legacy. He's built a, he has been a bridge builder throughout the entire Bavaria County. He's recognized by his peers. And so today we salute the Honorable Mr. Neely J. Done. And if I may read this into the minutes, please. Thank you. Go ahead and clap, man. We're, here. We're celebrating the great things that we do in the great city of Cocoa, and I'm very well proud of that. Even from my kids here, the Boy Scouts, to our senior kids like myself and Mr. Dunn and everyone behind us too as well. This key to the city is represented and presented to Mr. Neely J. Dunn in recognition of your continual involvement and commitment to the community, students, athletes throughout the years as an NFL officiating scout, Pac-12 conference, football game evaluator, NFL supervisor of officials. So every time you see the NFL on, maybe Saturday sometimes, Sunday, Monday, and Thursday, this is the gentleman right here. This is the head honcho. That's right, homegrown, all the way from hot chocolate, baby. Okay, he's a teacher, dean, assistant principal, and a principal, as well as being an inductee to several Hall of Frames, excuse me, presented by the Honorable Mayor and the Great City Council of the Great City of Cocoa on this day, March the 14th. Would everyone please stand and recognize Mr. Dunn, and let's give him a round of applause. for his positive accomplishments in the city of Coco. Mr. Dunn, any words of wisdom? Well, first of all, let me say uh, thank you to uh, Mayor Mike Blake for this opportunity and also the uh, others who worked along to make this uh, possible. Uh, I've had a great, uh, a great run. Uh, I'm a uh, hometown boy that uh, got a lot of opportunities because of people who helped me along the way. I must say that Dick Blake 
was the assistant principal at Cocoa High School when I left South Carolina State. Both my wife and I came back here and we taught at Cocoa High School. We were uh, 1972 graduates. Uh, uh, Dick Blake uh, talked me into getting my uh, master's degree. He also gave me an opportunity to uh, become head football coach, athletic director. After getting my master's, he uh, tutored me through, uh, through the following years. So I was able to be a dean, assistant principal, principal. Uh, I served uh, 25 years in the Brevard County School System, and then I left and went full-time with the NFL as a supervisor uh, for 16 years. Uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, helped me along the way, and I must say the one person that I want to recognize uh, who would be here with me is my uh, wife. We were both South Carolina State graduates. She worked in the school system for 35 years. She passed uh, this past October. Uh, so I wouldn't be here without her. She was with me every step of the way and uh, lived a good life, uh, and we had a great time for, uh, for the 45 years. So thank you so very much. I'm happy to be here, and uh, God bless you all. All right, all right, all right. Also, may I present you your team to your local justice to Don. Uh, to all the Bulldogs that are out there, uh, Trina Brown Lining is uh, televising this. She's streamlining, excuse me, this. Oh, excuse me, I thought I'm becoming a man now, y'all forgive me. <laughs> but we're being recognized by his peers. Uh, Coach Willie Dunn is also looking at this live through our, our access through streamlining. Uh, yeah, what did I say? Willie Jeffries. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Willie Jeffries. See how obedient I am? <laughs> Coach Willie Jeffries, that's right. I'm going to be a man with him. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. South Carolina State, yes, sir. Yes, sir. South Carolina State. So this young man has broke many barriers, cracked the ceiling, and he's done it with love and compassion commitment for our community. Um, can we reach out to that number that I gave you, Mr. Beach, sir, please? We have a, a few individuals that may call in just to acknowledge. Hello? Okay. Hello? Can you hear me, Trey Blake? I'm here. Okay. We have you on the microphone, sir. Um, would you like to share some words of wisdom? Because Trey Blake is a product of Cocoa High School, also a product of Mr. Neely Dunn through his leadership as officiating for the NFL. Go ahead, Mr. Blake. Yes, sir. So thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for not making it. I'm coming from trying to get there from Claremont, Florida, and just got caught up in some traffic. So I apologize for not making it. But I thank you for the opportunity to have a moment to just share a couple of words about Mr. Neely Dunn. Uh, you know, Neely has meant so much to us. You know, I met Neely probably when I was eight or nine years old, you know, and at that point he was a coach at Coco High School, you know. So he was one of the pillars in the community, someone that we could look up to, someone that, you know, was a trailblazer. Um, even before I knew that there was an opportunity for someone like myself or people in our community to start officiating, we had no idea about that. You know, we grew up and, you know, we enjoyed playing sports. We enjoyed doing what we did. Uh, you know, all we knew was being an athlete or being a coach. You know, Neely showed us that there was a different route. There's a different path for us to still be involved in athletics, to still be involved in the games, to still have an, a, a, a say, you know, and have a uh, input on kids' lives. You know, so that was one of the things my early impression with him is that he was a trailblazer in our community. He was somebody that was a pillar in the community, someone that you could look up to, someone that showed you that there was different paths and different opportunities for you. You know, going through his career, you kind of watch it from afar. As a kid, you know, you look at it and you're not really into officiating, but you're looking at that. That's someone that I know. That's someone that I can touch. That's someone I can reach out to that I have a personal relationship with, he's on TV. And, you know, and I get the opportunity to watch him and see what he's doing. You know, and so as growing up, coming through, um, you know, for myself, uh, I kind of fell into officiating just like a lot of other guys that were, were former athletes and they still wanted to be involved in athletics and still wanted to, you know, um, have something to do with trying to mentor kids and being there for kids and trying to help them out. 
and it was a different opportunity. You know, so as soon as I got into it, got into officiating, Neely has always been someone that's been there as a mentor, as a friend, as a companion, you know, someone that I can reach out to, that I can talk to. You know, he and I still have conversations about those things. He's still involved with the community. Uh, and he reaches out to us, you know, whenever he sees me, you know, he, he reaches out to me and gives me a phone call and just tells me how proud of me that he is. And that means so much to me. So I just want to celebrate him, celebrate everything that he, he means to me, everything that he's done for the community, yes. everything that he's done for the, the officiating community, and just tell him how much we appreciate him, how much we love him, how much you know we, we appreciate the support that he's given him, and we support him. So I'm just so thankful to have him in my life, thankful to have him as a mentor, to have him as a friend, have him as a, as a companion. You know? and, and, again, I apologize for not being there in person. I wanted to be there so badly in person, uh, you know, to be able to celebrate him in that way. But I'm just so thankful for him and thankful for the opportunity that you guys have given me to be able to speak up, just, you know, share my story of Neely Dunn and everything that he's done for myself personally, for the officiating community and the community of Coco Floor. All right. Th thank you very much, Mr. Blake. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Yes, sir. So we're glad to give you joy now, sir, because you've earned it and you deserve it. So we thank you for being a good and faithful servant for the people, by the people, and for the right reason, because you're empathetic and you care. And that speaks volumes. So on behalf of the great city of Coco and the Blake family, to the Dunn family, we say thank you very much. Again, let's give Mr. Dunn a round of applause. <clears throat> a very humble young man, very humble, as you can see. Again, thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. God bless. A picture. Yeah, let's get a picture, man. So this is a, a proclamation, whereas the Florida Government Finance Officers Association is a professional association founded in 1937 and serves more than 3,300 professionals from state, county, and city governments, school districts, colleges and universities, special districts, and private firms. And whereas the FGFOA is dedicated to being your professional resource by providing opportunities through education, networking, leadership, and information. And whereas this Government Finance Professionals Week, sponsored by the FGFOA and all its member governmental organizations, is a week-long series of activities aimed at recognizing government finance professionals and the vital services that they provide to our state and our community. And whereas during this week, government finance professionals throughout the state of Florida will be acknowledged for their hard work, dedication, and leadership. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Michael C. Blake, on behalf of the City Council of the City of Cocoa, Florida, do hereby proclaim March 20th to 24th, 2023, as Government Finance Professionals Week in the City of Cocoa, and extend our appreciation to all government finance professionals throughout the state and here in the City of Cocoa for their hard work, dedication, and leadership. Thank you. Uh, for your leadership, uh, Mr. City Manager, um, uh, City Attorney, Finance Director, and all departments of the Great City of Cocoa. Again, teamwork is dream. Proceeding on to delegations, I have a few cards in my hand, and I would like for you to, if you have a card in your possession, please come forward and state your name and submit that card.
First on the list will be Mr. Marino. Sir. Would you please come forward and state your name, sir? You have 180 seconds to elaborate on your issue, sir. Thank you. My name is Sylvia Marino, and I'm over on District 3. I live on 2217 Spring Circle. And I'm here today to talk to you guys about my commute to work. Um, I commute to work on a bicycle, and I work over on Grissom on, at the Net House. So I go down 524, and I take a left in front of Publix, and I go up to Grissom, and I take another left, and I go down to the shop. Here's the thing. When I go right in front of Publix, and I'm in front of that Publix, the trucks are coming by. They're looking left, turning right. So they're coming, pew, pew, pew. I invite anyone to go over there early in the morning and see all these trucks going by. Then I go to the middle. When I go to the middle, you got the turning people that are coming to the left. They're not looking this way, so I gotta be yelling at them as I'm going across. When I go across, you got the cars coming the other way that are about to cream me. Then I'm on the, tur I'm on the lane. You got everybody getting on the highway, and no matter how lit up I am, and I am a Christmas tree, you'll think I'm going to the Christmas parade with my bicycle. I get up to there, and everybody's cutting me off, cutting me off to get up on the highway. Then I get a little bit further down, uh, where I go under where the train is, and that's where no man's land. I get creamed on both sides because you got the, the uh, people coming off the overpass, high rate of speed, and I am now have to go into that lane. That lane is the through lane that goes through. You got the turning lane. <sighs> Let me catch my breath here. <laughs> you got your turning lane that goes into CMAX, and then you got your two lanes that turn to the left. So I am on the through lane. I am on the through lane, and I am there. It's a little curve, so if the trucks are lined up there, I have no easement because the trucks have their wheel on the easement, so I am on the road. <clears throat> and when you get to that light, and you pass that light, there's a median there, and there's a ditch. If my bicycle is there, and there's a truck coming at 45 miles an hour, I am done. I have no chance in that spot. So what do I have to do? Renegade, I have to go into CMAX, where I'm not supposed to be, I'm probably trespassing, going in the dangerous place to be able to come out because that is a path of least danger for me. And I have to go through there. On the way back, no difference. Along the road, it's all full of dirt. I called all the people about the dirt on the road to get that cleaned up because I have none. And again, anywhere you turn right, anywhere on that corridor, people are turning right, they're not looking right. That's my only easement, and if I'm not there, I'm in the ditch. We all live around here. I challenge you all, go slow and see what, what my, our options are. There is none. My suggestion, simple signs, signs on the, on the thing, bicycle lanes, bicycles sharing roadway, something because me being right within the law, with the lights on, having the right of way, does nothing for me when they clip me a little bit, because if they hit me a little bit, I lose. There's no way that I'm gonna win. And it shouldn't have to be in a eight to 12 minute ride, risking my life every single day, and I do that ride twice a day. Yes, sir. Okay. This, uh, Mr. City Manager, I know you're taking copious notes, uh, so uh, our, our Chief of Police. Um, <coughs> I think you've identified the, the problem, and admirable solutions serve from bypass that we normally see along the highway but where it's uh, engraved with the picture, a white picture, you know what I'm saying, the white painting of a person yes. riding a bike. And also uh, something, a, a informational sign indicating speed also. Bringing that down a little bit. Yes, Bringing sir. that speed down right in front of C-Max 45. Man, how's a truck going 45 miles through that intersection? That's loaded. <laughs> it's crazy that they go that fast. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, thank Mr. you. Mr. City Manager, do you have that, sir? Okay. Uh, Mr. Stowe, Greg right. Stowe, you're taking copious notes too as well? Yes, sir. Okay, because he's part of the group there on the 524. Is it TPO and what else, sir? Something else? Yeah, Space okay. Coast TPO. And then Space also Coast TPO. Advisor. Advisory okay. So it's not, thank you for coming okay. forward and having the courage, Mr. Moreno. Thank you. And I was encouraged by the different officers that I spoke to, and they're like, we're doing what we can. Yes, they vowed sir. they'd be there from 6.30 to 6.45, because that's when I commute through there. 
and they're doing what they can, but they're the ones that encourage me. Go to the there and talk to the councilman and go to, and because this is where things will get done. So thank you so thank much. You I here, appreciate it. Thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. Please. That's fine. Thank you. Thank God for daylight saving time, too, as well. Thank God for that. I think you got a question here. Come back, please, sir. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman calls, ma'am. Yeah, I was just going to say, I also sit on the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization Governing Board. Um, I know there are plans that 524 quarter from industry, actually to Michigan, going the other way, are, is under design. Mm -hmm. uh, with hopes to do the next leg soon, but even that is years off. And that is a, um, 524 would be a state road. So who do we need to coordinate with? Who do we coordinate with to make sure yeah. this happens? Yeah, 524 and industry are both state roads yeah. in Grissom's County. So we can, we can work to coordinate that with them. More than likely, any improvement on industry would be handled with 524 and as we know that's mm -hmm. that's in pd and e right now it's a, a long yeah. way out yeah well it, it's it's just about uh, uh setting everybody person, known and, you know yeah any improvement of course is going to include multi molded now so i'm so glad that you bring this forward there's also a survey right now that was developed by space coast tpo that um if you have an email I'd like to send that to you. I would like you to have that link. Absolutely. You want okay. my email? Yeah, or I I could, I'll just give you my card. Okay. Okay, Councilman Dow. Also, uh, on that road, it happened about five, maybe six years ago. An uh, individual was riding a bicycle, and something happened. He jumped out right in front of a truck and got ran over, and he did not make it. Okay. And that was a big mess. I don't want so to it's, not, it's not the first one. Hopefully it never happened again. Uh, you just have to be careful going through there. And thanks for the, you know, you called the city manager secretary up and she sent me the message and I got a hold of you today. So that worked out good. Thank you. Thank right. you. I appreciate that. May I approach to you? Yeah. Okay. 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 Mr. Brad Whitmore, come to the podium, please, sir. And after uh, Mr. Brad Whitmore will be, hey, Blue, Big John, too. Uh, hello, Brad Whitmore. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Um, I'm uh, with the historic Cocoa Village Main Street. Uh, believe it or not, I'm going to be brief this evening. Uh, I have an observation that uh, is something that uh, may be known, maybe not known, but I was out rowing today in a boat, and I went by in front of uh, Riverfront Park and the promenade and noticed on the face, the uh, wall face that faces out to the water, so you can't see it from the land, you can see it from the water, there was at least one, two, three instances of repetitive graffiti that was obnoxious, and it looked like it was fairly fresh. I'd never seen it before, but I just want to mention it to whoever is in charge of getting rid of that, that uh, I know we don't want to have that as what would be welcoming people around our beautiful Coco sign uh, front and center in uh, Riverfront Park. So that's all I've got. I just wanted to mention it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Whitmore. Uh, I appreciate your keen observation and keeping us informed. In order for us to make a well-informed decision, we must be knowledgeable. Right. Thank you. Okay, next, Mr. Big Blue. Hey, Big John, too. Hey, everybody. Uh, John Verdi, founder of Hey Blue. Uh, hey Blue facilitates meaningful connections between police officers and the community that they serve. Uh, I just wanted to come and give a really brief update about a couple of things that we were able to accomplish over the past couple of weeks. Uh, specifically, and working with the police department um, and um, two of their officers, uh, Officer Johnson, Sierra Johnson, and Officer Gabriel, as well as K-9 Copper to go into the pre-K classrooms in Endeavor and um, connect with the kids. So those officers and I were able to have over 150 positive connections with the kids. And what makes that meaningful is the fact that, um, you know, we work really hard so that the kids get to know the officers. And so when we walked in, it was great to see the, the time before that we walked in um, and the kids actually remembered the officers' first names. And it, it really struck a chord with them, you know? And so, um, and of course, you know, canine copper, right? Like everybody loves the dog. But um, so I want to report that and that um, 
you know, that, that does have an actual meaningful impact, you know, with the lives of those of the children. Um, and then to further the impact, we actually had a design thinking session where um, I, I was here last time inviting you all to. Um, that happened on the 7th where we had over 30 people from the community show up, as well as some of the members on the dais. Um, and we had over 100 positive connections that day. And those positive connections actually fueled a $500 donation from Hey Blue that, uh, to Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Florida's Bigs with Badges program. So I specifically wanted to say thank you to the chief to having the officers there, the you know council members and yourself, Mr. May on the dais. Um, but I also, you know, um, some of you might talk about how um, you know how that night went and how we wanted to sit there and really listen to the community. And so, um, and myself and listening to the community post, um, post the, um, the event, we see that uh, people were asking, uh, they're saying that they did not know about the event long, you know, long enough in advance. So I can't, I'm coming to let you all know that there's going to be another one. Uh, we're going to be doing it again at Endeavor. We're just waiting for the final date from um, the principal at Endeavor. But I want to, you know, specifically ask every single councilman and the mayor and city manager, please, for the next one, please go out of your way to invite people to be there. Uh, we ask that the people are, that are there um, have something to say, but also, and more importantly, that they want to work towards solutions together. Okay? And I got nine seconds. <laughs> oh, okay, bad. <laughs> well, let me be first to say, very informative. The interaction, the engaging of the audience, young and seasoned. I'm not going to say old because I'm seasoned. <laughs> but it was well um, informed with information, valuable information. And people could speak freely. And that was a beautiful thing that uh, I enjoyed. Thank uh, you, sir. Councilman Goins and then uh, Deputy Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Verdi, for just uh, continuing uh, making these positive connections with us in the police department. Um, I, I believe it's going to have a long-lasting impression on the, on the police as well as the community. And I also I wanted to kind of add to what you're saying. Um, our um, chair for our police advisory committee um, at the end of the session did a do's and don'ts of police stops. And, and so sometimes, again, people... Um, look at our police advisory committee as something that is a, a negative thing towards police officers. So it was very positive for, for him as the chair to come out and uh, teach the community how to interact and how not to interact with, uh, with the police department. So again, thank you, Hey Blue, and, and you for, and your wife for doing what you do. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yep, sir. Yes, I just want to I just wanted to give a thank you uh, to you for uh, creating an avenue, a safe space for the community as well as the officers um, uh, to come together and, and actually hear all perspectives from, from the officer's point of view, uh, community members' point of view, and not just come there to complain. We actually got, we, we found common ground and solutions. So I think the event was very helpful. Even people that didn't attend uh, due to us having the, uh, the event where we posted social media pictures. Um, there was a lot of positive feedback, at least from my Facebook page, and people looking forward to the next event. So I'm looking forward to it as well, and thank you. Keep up the good work as well. Thank you, uh, Coco PD, as well, for being willing to participate. Absolutely. Okay. I'd just like to say we have, a, we have a target of, we'd like to get 75 community members at the next one. This one we had 30, so I would like to at least, you know, at least double it, maybe, you know, we can only ha have that so many, right, because of the space, but um, I hope that it grows to the point where we can have a lot, a lot of, of people and a lot of, a lot of conversations. Let's do it. So, all right. Thank you so much. I, I believe in you, Big Blue. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman, hold on, sir. Oh, John. Well, John. Yeah, I was just. Uh, yes, sir. Councilwoman Carl, sir. Sorry, I was just going to say I'm so sorry I wasn't able to go no on that particular night, but I've really applaud you for the focus on solutions that's so refreshing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I hope to see you at the next one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Teamwork is dream work, sir. Okay, I think 
Um, this concludes delegations. I have no any additional cards. Um, <clears throat> I do have some cards for other additional items in the agenda. I do have your card, Mrs. Rose, Christy Rose. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> so this concludes delegations. Proceeding on to consent agenda item. Um, the chief wanted to say something about this documentation, sir. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council. So re regarding uh, item number uh, six is twenty three dash one seven seven, the Boca Grant agenda. So uh, we're requesting that you approve uh, that we apply for the grant, which is one eighteen nine twenty one. The initial um, cost to the city was um, twenty thousand seven sixty nine oh seven. And we learned that there was some additional cost that was not included. And the additional cost was for per diem for meals and hotel 664 for cell phone 1,104. Victim rights brochure, which is uh, 1,980. Uh, office supplies 750. And then the victim services practitioner designation update, which is 299, which that cost there is. Four thousand seven ninety-seven. So the total cost to the city would be twenty-five thousand five sixty-six point oh seven. With that change. Please make the adjustment as I said to you in the original beginning um, um, under consent agenda item. Do we need to make a motion, Mr. City Manager? Um, excuse me, Mr. City Attorney, to uh, make that. Clearly stated for that particular item on the consent agenda, sir. I think it's been stated by the chief, so it would be as amended on the vote on the consent agenda. Thank you very much, sir. What are the wishes of council? Motion to approve. We have a motion on the floor by Councilman Dow. <coughs> Second. Second by Councilman Goins. Chairs will call the question. All in favor of saying aye. 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 And opposed? Ayes have unanimous with this seat. This concludes the consent agenda item. Now we will proceed on to public hearing. Okay, uh, 6-1, public hearing considered on first reading of ordinance number 0-2023, a zoning map amendment consistent with Appendix A, zoning article 22, changing the official zoning map designation of two parcels, parcels of land totaling 0.64 acres from County Single Family Residential, RU1-19, to City Single Family Residential, RU1-72361. Um, Esquire Garganisi, would you read this into the minute, sir? Um, ordinance uh, 001-2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Cocoa Brevard County, Florida, amending the official zoning map designation of two parcels of real property totaling 0.64 acres more or less and generally located on the southeast corner of Aurora Street and Jackson Street, more particularly depicted, legally described on Exhibit A attached here too, from Brevard County RU19 single family residential to RU17 single family residential district, providing for the repeal of prior and consistent ordinances, resolution, severability, and an effective date. And this is first reading and uh, of this quasi judicial action. Mayor. Thank you very much, Esquire Garganisi. As of March 1st, 2023, the PNZ board meeting and the board recommended the approval of the city council ordinance number 01-2023 zoning map amended consistent with the Esquire Garganese state. Uh, Mr. Smith, sir. Yes, you all sum most of it up, but uh, these properties were annexed back in 2004 and the future land use was applied, but the zoning was not. So we, we have an application that came in and in order for us to, to work through that application, it was for a church. They have to get the zoning first. Uh, once, uh, if second reading passes, then they will have to come in for a special exception for that church, which would go in front of Board of Adjustments. Thank you very much, sir. Do we have any questions? Uh, Reverend Homer Brown, Rogers High graduate too as well. Good man, good Christian man at that, that I do support in this endeavor. Do we have any questions for Mr. Uh, Smith? Seeing on uh, chair like the uh, excuse I'll me, your light on? I'll wait, I'll wait. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Seeing on, uh, I would like to open this portion to the public and close it to council. Please feel free to come to the podium and state your name 
and elaborate on this particular item. Anyone in the audience? Going once, going twice. Chair, I'd like to close this portion to the public and return it to the council. Councilman, go on, sir. Yes, sir. As far as both of those um, properties, what what are the parking requirements? Um, it, did he purchase both lots? As far as I know, he owns both lots. Yeah. The parking requirements will depend on the size, size of, of, it, of the church. church he comes in with. And then they, he purged those old run-down vehicles off his property mm -hmm. and cooperated with the code enforcement and the police department, and he spearheaded that. And um, I, too, yes, I, I would like to make a motion. I know it's in your district, so I don't know. I'm down with it. Yep. Motion to approve. Uh, and I'll second it. Okay, church, going to call the question. All in favor of saying aye. 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 Any nays? Ayes so have it unanimously. Proceeding on to item number 7-1. Approve the current code enforcement lien for the property located on 714 Johnson Street be reduced to $2,000 as recommended by the Code Enforcement Board 23-132. So um, I myself, um, I support the Code Enforcement and the, and the Board. I, God bless you. So if, any questions? Do we have any questions for the Chief? If not, the current market value of that piece of property is 15000 The Code Enforcement Board at its regular meeting on February 16, 2023, recommended that the lien be reduced to twenty. Excuse me, $2,000. So Chair would like to make a motion to approve the recommendation stated by the Code Enforcement lien located on 714 Johnson Street. Second. And we have a second by Councilwoman Cough. Just going to call the question on all in favor of saying aye. Aye. Any nays? I have it unanimously. Proceeding on to item number 7-2, the request to council to award bid hashtag B2315-COC to the lowest bidder, Sapphire Elevator, for the elevator upgrade at the historic Cocoa Village Playhouse in the amount of $67,083 and execute the agreement, approve the resolution, amend the fiscal year budget, BAF, hashtag 23-047-A, approve a project contingency resolution for the approval of any change order not to exceed $7,060. Authorize the city manager to execute amendments and extensions to the agreement within the approved contingency of 23-133. The Cocoa Village Playhouse improves the city's image and culture. And I do support this, and clearly it's uh, denoted in your information. Mr. Smith? Yes, uh, just, entertains a motion. just to I provide counsel a little bit of background um, with this agreement. It was originally entered in with the Playhouse in uh, 2010, and then it was amended in 2014. And within that agreement, there's a number of items and obligations that the city has. With that, um, we're to cover all the utilities costs for the facility, which is roughly around 50000 a year, which obviously that goes up with rate increases. Uh, we handle all the pest control, security, and fire protection systems as well. Those items are capped at 70000 per year on what, what we can spend. We can obviously go over that if we choose to. And then we're also responsible for any capital replacement or repairs. The city does have the option with the agreement to to say we don't want to make that repair, and then at which point the service provider, which would be the playhouse, they they would have the option to make those repairs through an agreement with the city. Um, so we, we have this item for roughly the the sixty seven thousand. We'll have another item coming up here probably at the next meeting for a little over a hundred thousand dollars on the alarm panel, and then last year we also did some HVAC replacement at the Playhouse with, within the agreement as well as part of that capital plan within it before it was amended. The city was responsible for, for basically rebuilding the orchestra pit, the seating, um, really what, what made it the, the Playhouse. So I, I think it's helpful to, to have some of the background on it and some of our obligations with, with that agreement as we, we talk about some of these capital replacements. It's a, it's a historic building. So any replacement we make is going to have a higher dollar amount than just a typical one. And we're starting to see some of these failures occur. 
Uh, just say I agree with the mayor. This is uh, priceless. <coughs> the um, the village playhouse. Um, it looks like then. So we're looking at probably 120,000 maintenance per year, plus items that come up. Is that round around 150? Which and then. Yeah. Any proceeds that the Village Playhouse collects, all that goes back into their program, right? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Okay, well, this is the first time I had seen it laid out, so thank you for the explanations. Um, and I would make a motion to approve unless there are other comments, questions. Yeah, motion approved by Councilman Cause and seconded by Councilman Dow. Councilman Gowan, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, can, they, can anyone tell me what is the lease agreement amount? That we have with, um, what, what is the amount, a dollar? What is it? Yeah, I think that was just to record it. There's no, there's no dollar amount on the lease for the building. So no dollar amount on the lease. All funds brought in by that particular nonprofit or the playhouse itself, the company, stay with them. stays with them, which covers probably the actors and other things. So... Can, can you tell me that the you you spoke about another item that's coming up? What was that again? That's the fire alarm control panel. So the one there is is obsolete and needs to be completely replaced. Mm -hmm. um, so that that'll probably run. The bids are out. Um, it's probably going to be around one hundred seventeen, hundred twenty thousand. So so Brian, the city owns the building. Correct. Yes. So city owns the building. The uh, playhouse operates. Um, we have annual maintenance costs, and then we have whatever capital repair costs that come up. Yes, yeah, the, the Playhouse's maintenance and operation is related to the, the Playhouse activities themselves. Mm. So, but any standard operating and maintenance activities that are performed by the city. And these are, these are coming out of your contingency, right, Mrs. Bowman? This is contingency? Yeah. Do we own the Porsche house? Can't hear you. Do we own the Porsche house? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Do we own the Civic Center? We're Civic Center, two two museums, Porsche house, the Playhouse. Uh, it's just like America owning the Statue of Liberty. It's going to cost. Oh, yeah. Two museums, yeah. Yes, sir. So I, I believe in the citizens of Coco. Um, I, and it's a great investment. I, I understand, and I thank you for being good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. And you're asking excellent questions. And there's some tough decisions we have to make, but we have to do what's best for the city of Coco. So, any other questions, Mr. Bowen, sir? Um, yes, but not right now. Okay, sir. I'll do it at another time. Okay. Yes, sir. I know it's tough, sir. I, Feel the pain. I understand, but um, it's been a historical landmark. It's been there even prior to me being a young man, and uh, even my father, along with everyone's family members, attended that facility, that building. So I think it's a great investment, and I will continue to back it. And I'm gonna just leave it like that. Now I'm gonna call the question. Close my mouth. All in favor, saying aye. Aye. Any nays? No. We have four yes. And one day. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Proceeding on to item number 7 3. Council to approve to join with the state of Florida and other local governmental units as a participant in the Walmart Florida Settle Agreement and release formal agreements implementing a unified plan for the allocation and the use of a prospective settlement dollars from opioid-related litigation 23-164. Um, this has included council representing cities and counties throughout the state of Florida. Um, this item also, the, kid, the city of Cocoa previously joined the settlement in agreement with the state of Florida on December the 14th, 2021, under resolution 2021-126. Coco is allotted approximately forty thousand, excuse me, forty-two thousand seventy-three dollars and twelve cents. This will bring the budget into adjustment and resolution back to the city council 
once the revenue is received and the expenses, budgets, uses at this time. Do we have any questions for Chief Collier? If not, Chair entertains a motion. Chair would like to make a motion. I, I will know. recognize you like uh, Councilwoman Carl, Carl, excuse me. Chair would like to make a motion based on staff recommendation. And I'm looking for a second. I'll second it. Okay, we have a second on the floor by Councilman uh, Dow. Um, also, Council pre previously approved this agenda item 21783 to enter into the sub agreement with the state of Florida. Councilwoman Cross, ma'am. Oh, well, I just have a question. I mostly, maybe I just missed it, but so is uh, Project PD 22 OS, is that drug related? Is it going back into a, a drug type program or just the 42,000? That, that's a project number that we use to keep yeah. track of the money. Um, but yes, uh, there are specific uses of the mm -hmm. settlement proceeds um, that the police department has to follow to be able to spend the money. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Ma'am. Chair, go call the question. All in favor saying aye. 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 And then nays? Eyes have it unanimously. Proceeding on to item number 8-1. Okay, council approval to apply for phase one design and permitting grant through the Florida Inland Navigation District Fund for the design of a new dock system and breakwater to replace and protect the day slips that were destroyed by hurricanes in and Nicole, located at the Coco Riverfront Waterfront Park. Approve the resolution, excuse me, approve the resolution authorizing the city manager to execute and grant applications 23-166. The approximate cost is $168,000. Design should be complete by the end of September 2025. Permit, excuse me, excuse me, I don't know why I'm tired of talking today. Permitting may increase a duration of the phases depending on the complexity of the breakwater system. Also, no fiscal 23 funds are required at this time. If awarded, staff will return to council and accept the fine agreement for the COCO CRA on December 23, excuse me, December 13, 2022. Council approved the demolition of the damaged day slips. Okay, Mr. Public Works. Yes, that, that summed it up for the most part. So this is yes. the, the replacement of the damaged day slips as well as including a design for some type of breakwater system, whether that's a living breakwater system, um, just simple pilings and wood, or some type of floating concrete breakwater. Um, so we'll go through the design and, and try to select some alternatives, obviously, depending on which one you pick, it'll change the permitting and the construction cost of that. So that's why the, the design is set out to 2025. Councilwoman calls, ma'am. Yeah, it's just if the design is 2025, will we actually get it built in my lifetime? If we get the design completed, then we'll go for construction through find. Okay. The, so any so, but we, we're looking at probably 28. Yeah, 20, I'd say 27, 28 would be likely. Okay. Permits. That's what I was looking for. That's the permitting process. That's the yes, tedious requirement. The wheels of government grind slowly, but exceedingly fine. Okay. Did he answer your question, Councilwoman Calls, ma'am? Yes. Thank you, motion to approve. We have a motion on the floor by Councilwoman Calls. Second. Second by Councilman Goins. Just gonna call the question. All in favor of saying aye. Aye. Nay nays. Ayes have it unanimously. Okay, Mrs. Um, Christy Rose, we're getting ready to bring your item up. So if you wouldn't mind coming sitting right here on the front row, please, kindly, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, item number 8-2, Steph recommends approval to remove an oak tree at 2514 Swanee Drive and provide a replacement oak tree at Bronco Pond, excuse me, Bronco Stormwater Park. I'm old school. And to remove an oak tree at 307 Blake Avenue and provide a replacement Magnolia Tree at Brocco Stonewater Park. Mr. Stonewater, he himself, Mr. Smith, and then we'd like to hear from Mrs. Uh, Rose. Yeah, so this is uh, the staff request for the removal of, of two oak trees. The first one, 2514 Swanee. Um, our, our arborist, we have a staff arborist that's certified, uh, reviewed the tree, found that it needed to be removed. 
and that was his recommendation there. For that one, the Planning and Zoning Board denied that, um, and they wanted an annual assessment done by a licensed certified arborist. Uh, we did include our arborist's certification in that. He's, he's licensed per what our city code requires for that. Uh, the other tree is over at the Harry T. Moore Center. Uh, for whatever reason, when it was planted, they, they put the sidewalk all the way around the base of the tree. I'm sure at that time, it, it wasn't as close to the trunk as it is now, but it's pushing up on that, and it's also starting to affect some of the underground piping that goes to that building. And so with that being a historic building, we really don't want to take any risk of, of ruining anything that could impact the inside or outside of that building. Uh, with that one, the uh, Planning and Zoning Board recommended a magnolia tree be planted at Bracco. Uh, we don't have an issue with that recommendation for a tree, so um, staff agrees with, with that particular recommendation. But for 2514, um, staff would like to, to remove that tree and, and do a replacement oak tree over at Bracco. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Smith? Pass one call. Yeah, I was, um, I had recently reviewed the. Uh, well, it was actually part of the three-year grant that we got um, where we had in 2021, there was an urban forest management plan. And as a part of that, they went through, they inventoried all the trees in the city. They, um, and they identified 51 that were in very poor condition and that we needed to work on. Have we been working on that list? So most of my questions are not really in regard to these, but have we been making use of that inventory? And is this one of the trees, the I'm not, Swanee Drive? I'm not sure, it should be on the inventory, but I'm not sure what the recommendation for this particular, or these two were. We are trying to work through some of those list items. Not all of those were oak trees. Some of the ones on there are actually stumps and things like that as well, and invasive trees. So we're, we're working through some of that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the uh, tree stocking, which you know it suggested so that we could bring up our inventory mm -hmm. and not be losing and then making we had a number of tr big old trees go down in the neighborhood just recently um, and so this the plan that they did for us suggests that we do that we restock as well and let's see 40 trees per year if we were really gonna make gains on it, we would have to do. And in terms of lining streets and our rights of way, they would be 50 feet apart, and we would begin to go through and kind of get rid of those where they are too crowded, but try to create you know, some nice canopies. So are we proceeding on that plan? Do we have, it, right, I know we don't, we don't have an arborist yet, right? We do, we have a licensed certified arborist okay. since last So we October. do on staff. We, we do. Right now, our, our first goal is Bracco, uh, mainly because we have the exercise equipment. That's That's been a big discussion. We haven't received the year $3 yet to start that process. When, when we move on from Bracco and start looking at street trees, that's something within that report or that management plan, I would say it's, it's a general recommendation. We can't do that on all roadways. We mm -hmm. need to look at overhead lighting, what's there, as well as what Jack has on the ground in terms of water and sewer, mm -hmm. as well as gas. We don't want to run into an issue where a tree down during a hurricane leads to a water main break and, and makes things worse in those situations. So the, the biggest thing the report stresses is the right tree, right place. Right. And we'll work through that and we'll probably work through some of the more bare corridors first and, and see where we can do that and, and just kind of work our okay. way through the city. And in regard to the right tree, right place, one of the things the reports pointed out was that we are 10% is about as much as you want of any one tree species. Of course, we've got over that in oak. Um, and not that that's bad, because that's kind of our eye country, and you know we love the shade of the old oak. And However, um, at Arbor Day, I know we had already because the committee got together and we made some suggestions on trees, but they had already oh, been purchased. So the ones that we're giving away are oaks and maples, and they're not really ones that were suggested. We're, uh, we're giving away, uh, I believe, bald cypress, oak, live oaks, and then as well as the red maple. 
And with the 10%, the stock, you know, the, the main concern there is if you have more than 10% in, in one confined area, you see it a lot with pine trees. Yeah. When they get disease, it spreads quicker through those types of trees. Mm -hmm. Racco, I think we're still okay with that, depending on where we where we plant. But that's something we'll take into account as, as we start planting in some of okay. these areas. Okay, thank you. Do we need a motion to approve? Oh, you already, we are, you made uh, a motion. And he's seconded. We oh, also have Mrs. Rose is first. You got to submit a card. And I have a card. Can I ask you to submit that card? And come on, bring your card. I'm going to be professional, but you know I ask you to submit the card. Is that yes. not audience? Yes, sir. But no, Mrs. Rose is first. Yeah, turn right. your card in. I just in. wanted to answer your question. Okay, thank you, Captain. Mrs. Rose, please come forward. Well, I reported the tree at 24. 2514 Swanee Drive because I live in the house behind the tree. Yes, ma'am. Um, the it's tree is right. rotten, and I'm in fear for the next hurricane season that it's going to land on my house. Mm -hmm. So it does definitely need to come down. Um, you know, uh, my bedroom's right there when it lands. If I'm sleeping at night, you're going to have me under that tree. So, <laughs> okay. I agree. That's all. Safety right. first and foremost, ma'am. Huh? Safety first. That's right. Foremost. That's right. That's why I reported the tree. Thank you, so, Captain. Appreciate okay. It. Yes, ma'am. And, and it's not falling on deaf ears. Okay. Wood that is green comes to the podium. Pray before you get there. <laughs> <laughs> Wood that is green. Um, I'm just requesting that since the majority of the PNZ board meeting that we had, uh, we didn't get this information that we had a city arborist that was asked during the meeting. We didn't know that. Uh, I would just like it as a courtesy that this can be postponed until we hear directly from this licensed arborist from the city to give us information about why it's chosen that uh, it should be removed, contradictory to what the board voted on. As a courtesy, I think that would be important because every one of us, when we saw the information, there was no need. We felt that it was important to remove the tree. So since we didn't have the information at that board meeting, I think it would be wise to potentially look at it again. That is a tree that's been there for quite some time. And before we quickly remove it in an hour that took 100 years for it to grow there, uh, I, I think it's just uh, appropriate for it to be discussed before the PNC board meeting the next time we have a meeting. Um, and that's all I wanted to Which say. What are you talking about, sir? Swanee. Lady Swanee. Smoke? I understand, but. It's on the back bedroom, council, uh, former councilman. You know, as well as I know and everyone else. That, well, if that tree is in your backyard. Well, I understand I'm all for safety, but we did not get the information that I'm asking that present that, that needs to be presented to the PNC board. That's all. Because it was unanimous for it to be saved. That's all. Tree's dead, right, Mr. Smith? It's, it's dying. Would, yeah. We all are. <laughs> uh, yeah, we but all are. With, <laughs> within the planning and zoning <laughs> agenda <laughs> item. I, I'm like, we are. Dad, I'm dying to live. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Councilman Goins and Mrs. Rose, I'll bring you back. You're going to get me in all sorts of trouble. But come on up on the front row, ma'am. Okay. Because I'm, I'm Team Rose. Well, it's the, the tree where it's rotting is like six foot up. The, where the branches, the old, the earlier branches were taken off because they were hanging over into the street and stuff. It, everywhere where there was a branch, that hole is rotting inside the tree. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they're all like right around in the same place to where it's all just coming together in the same place in that tree. Mm -hmm. So at six foot up, it's going to break mm -hmm. off and land on my roof. And, <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, uh, uh, okay. Councilman, uh, go on to you, Councilwoman Carl. And then uh, the wood that is green will come to your house and repair your home. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, uh, Councilman Goins, and then you next, Councilwoman Carl. Yeah, this is a question for Mr. Smith. Um, I know it's a lot of talk about percentages, how much percent we have of this tree in the city and that tree of the city, right? So, say my house, I decide. Um, to plant 
six oak trees, baby oak trees, and young oak trees. How does the city know that I planted those trees? We don't have control over that. Right. So, so how are we using? I guess my question. Again, I'm ignorant to this. I don't. I don't under. I, I'm trying to get some clarity. If we're going to use percentages, more than likely, it sounds like the percentages may not be correct. Am so I am I the, wrong the, for saying that? The percentages from the the plan that was only an inventory of trees within our public spaces and right of ways. It didn't didn't take into account private property or heavily wooded areas like cocoa conservation area or something like that. Um, I, I would like to. Um, just point out one item. The PNZ board did receive the tree assessment form that was performed by the arborist mm -hmm. with the recommendation. Um, it's pretty detailed on the the cavities within the tree um, that it had pests and and the various risks associated with that tree. So that that was provided to the board as part of their their agenda package. Okay, and that's that's these two forms that we have here. Yes. Was in their package. The the one for the Harry T. Moore Center, that form was not included okay. within there, uh, but the one for Swanee was. Okay. Can we just make sure whatever they didn't receive, they received that maybe at their next meeting, just for informational purpose? I just want them to, because I know Mr. Greenwood is going to be there oh, yeah, on time. All right. I would think that the, the, the liaison, sir. That's all. Okay. I, I got you. I'm quiet. Go I ahead. Stitch you. calls in. Is that it, sir? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Councilwoman calls, ma'am? Yeah, I was just going to say the report, um, you know, to your point, ma'am, um, it does, it points to those unsealed wounds. So when they were, when the, the tree was pruned, it was not done correctly, which is unfortunate for the tree. But I also see where planning and zoning would have voted in favor of the tree because you know, part of the recommendation was to inspect it annually, if not removed. So, um, but I think, personally, I think the the fate is sealed for the tree, given the homeowner's um, feelings. Um, just to say that several trees have been removed in my neighborhood where the owners, I'm sure, and th this was, one was on public property, another on private property, but removed nonetheless a healthy tree, thinking that during a storm that tree was going to be a problem to them, when in fact the research shows that trees actually break wind energy. So if you're able to maintain your tree in a healthy way, pruning it correctly, those trees can actually be assets to you during a storm, um, as well as bring your air conditioning bill down as, as the shade um, reduces the temperature by 10 degrees. So, um, so I just wanted to make those points. Thank you. Is that it, ma'am? Yes. Thank you, Council. We have a motion on the floor by Councilwoman Call, second by Councilman Gorns. Just gonna call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Any names? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Mayor, I think that motion was for the previous item. I don't think you made one for this one. I don't have it. Yes, you did. That's I. You did earlier? Yes, I have uh, Mrs. Cosmo. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. I do have Mrs. Mo, uh, Mrs. Cosmo making the motion to second my house. Okay, for this one. Okay. You're right. You're right. You're good. You're good. You're good, man. Thank you for the observation. Ms. Kerr, Ms. Madam Clerk, you cannot do any wrong in my eyes. Pure point blank. Chief, please escort this man out. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> All right. This concludes this portion of council meeting. That's why I know he's doing a union break. <laughs> Um, we're going to proceed on to reports. Mr. Stoll, you're up next there, Mr. Train Man, Mr. Eaglet Man. Can I get maybe five instead of three, please? Do you have more green? I think so. Usually don't hit a timer for reports. Okay, we'll give it, uh, how about five minutes and 30 seconds? How about 
Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, okay, so here I am representing the, uh, uh, the, the CAC member uh, for City of Coco for the Space Coast TPO. Give you a, a report out. Uh, Carrie, did you get a chance to pass out the annual report? Already down. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, Ab uh, Abigail Hemingway uh, had been working on doing a uh, annual report for Space Coast TPO for a couple of years. Uh, we finally got it out and published. I figured I'd pass that off to you so you could all take a look. Uh, some of the things that are included are uh, an overview uh, on, that includes the committees and boards. If you don't understand how the TPO works, it might help you uh, understand how that flows. Uh, how transportation is funded. Uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 Councilwoman Koss is on the governing board, so she's intimately familiar with this. I wanted to let all the council folks know, uh, you know, there's the state, local, and federal funding. Uh, there's a section in there on featured projects. The uh, uh, ITS uh, uh, project, uh, which is a traffic management center, so they'll have a control room keeping an eye on all the traffic cameras and maybe they'll even be able to flip the green lights for you there, Lavender. <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, uh, planning for safety, 100% uh, 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 of the municipalities have now signed off on Vision Zero. Of course, we were one of the early adopters of uh, Vision Zero, uh, uh, thanks to Councilwoman Koss and y'all, uh, and oh, what do you know, bike, ped, and trail uh, advisory committee. And we just heard something about that tonight, didn't we? Uh, so I'll be running that back up there. Uh, I did talk to the gentleman outside, let him know that uh, state roads and county roads, <laughs> that takes a little bit of time, right? Uh, but it can get there. Uh, strategic planning, the, the three big work documents they did. TIP, Transportation Improvement Plan, short range stuff. The Unified Program Work Plan, kind of middle range stuff. And then the LRTP, going way out. Let's look 40 years down the road, what are the projects we need? Uh, things like uh, uh, Ellis Road widening or widening uh, the beach line going over to the beach. Okay, uh, outreach and partnerships. Uh, and oh, by the way, Brightline will be starting their 110 mile an hour testing on, uh, this just came out today, uh, March, uh, as soon as March 28th. What does that mean for us? Uh, the uh, Brightline, Space Coast TPO, City of Cocoa, and the Florida East Coast Railway Society is gonna be sponsoring a safety pop-up during some of that testing. And we've got some little goodie bags to pass out to the, the people who are gonna be stuck at the crossings. Uh, I have a, a, a very bad feeling about uh, uh, when, the, the <clears throat> uh, when the fatalities are gonna happen. Uh, it's already happening down south. We got to get that safety message out. Don't go around the gates, right? Uh, any any track, any train, any time type stuff. Okay. Uh, 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 and uh, back on March first, uh, uh, there was a symposium. Uh, it was ride the wave to resiliency. We had some guest speakers that they brought in. Uh, John Scott, uh, Brevard County uh, EMS Director, uh, uh, Corey Dibble, uh, uh, Safety in, in, uh, uh, for Port Canaveral, uh, uh, a few others, and of course Team Coco was there, Councilwoman Koss, Bryant Smith, Abigail Morgan, and myself, so it was very educational. Uh, and uh, I think I'm under my, hey, four minutes. Okay. I said we don't have a kind heart, sir, for you. Thank you, sir. I hope. Value provided, I hope. Thank you very much for your keenness and observation pertaining to the annual report of the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization. Matter of fact, they did a presentation at the Space Coast League of Cities last night, sir. So kudos to you, Mr. Stowe. Um, go ahead. All right, moving along with reports, uh, city manager. Um, this is Jamani, Mrs. Singer. Next, 
Thank you. Word over Thank you. Uh, okay. I'm sorry about that. Uh, sorry, right, go ahead. Uh, we got a report from Planning and Zoning, Mr. I have a report for the group, yes. Mr. Greenwood, step up. Thank you. Not good green, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a suggestion. When the when a tree is presented to the PNZ board for its potential removal, which I want to remind that uh, that board, the PNZ board, was able to bring the tree city designation to Coco. It was ignored and not supported for years, and that board unanimously asked for it to come back. Now. Next time that a present presentation is made and the staff is saying no to saving an oak tree, I highly recommend that that uh, arborist through the city makes the presentation and states why that person feels it needs to be removed. Because there's two things that bothered me. This is on public uh, uh, right away. This is not behind anybody's house or bedroom. This is on public property, this tree. Swanee, okay? And from my knowledge of oak trees, and I've planted about 25 or 30, they are easily to maintain. If the limbs were trimmed incorrectly, do you all know whose fault that is? Yeah. Because I do. The problem with them being trimmed incorrectly for years when we were not a tree city USA was because the city was trimming them incorrectly. Now that we have this brought up as something that's important, I feel that whenever there's a support from the staff to remove it, that it needs to be brought with that information to the board to make a legitimate decision. Because after the questions are asked of that hopefully licensed, this is the first time that I heard of this, licensed and certified. We've never had a licensed and certified arborist until this is news to me, maybe within a year or so. The past people that identified themselves that are arborist were not licensed and not certified. That's the problem we had. Now that things are becoming more correct, because the question about it being trimmed incorrectly, I have cut limbs off of oak trees where you only see the stump and it's only about seven or eight feet high. The tree comes back beautifully. Also, the key thing that kills an oak tree is the tap root. You can cut the roots that grow away from the uh, trunk of the oak tree. It does not kill it. What kills an oak tree is the tap root. And that was told by uh, a arborist licensed, very popular in the area, and it was presented to me that I presented to the PNZ board. So I, I don't, I, I don't feel comfortable when we are known as Oak Tree uh, City in the city of Coco to be just quickly after a hundred years of growth in a year it's gone. We need to really put more attention to it. And I highly recommend, I'm going to bring this up before the board, that if they vote on uh, supporting, that we hear from whoever the licensed and certified arborist comes to our board and tells us for discussion of why they support removing it. As an example, this particular tree. This should not be cut down. But that's all I wanted to share for now about that subject but it'll be bringing it back up uh, for any other future oak trees that come down. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I oh, agree. Hold on, out of respect, he, I have to surrender. Uh, they didn't call you, that's what I'm trying to say, because I left the podium. Uh, we're gonna move on to council on the calls for comment. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I agree with um, Alec Greenwood on this. I feel like we should, the arborists should go to the tree board if they're really going to make um, an informed decision. Can we do that? Is that something that we can do in the future? Correct. The, the report was there, the certification was there as well. Yes, he's one of our uh, 
Maintenance twos, I believe. We met the guidelines, and that's okay. I mean, one of the things I thought about too when I looked at the Harry Moore tree, the the Moore Center tree, was was Harry Moore alive? Did he walk under that tree? You know, I mean, trees have they carry a lot. And that Moore, the, the Moore School has some big, beautiful trees that you know have been there since its beginning. Okay. Can I, can I ask? Uh, student manager. This, this, that form, that assessment form is a standardized form. Did we create that? No, it's the ISA tree assessment form. Okay, so we can, we can do a staff summary of the recommendation on, a, on like a little little uh, one-page memo there that clarifies the recommendation. Uh, Councilman Gluens? Yes, sir. Um, I, I don't necessarily have an issue with the arborist being at those meetings, but if you um, are a tree enthusiast, no matter what the arborist says, no matter how much expertise that he has, you're not going to want it to come down. That's just... So I don't know if will it be effective to even make that process available when you know no matter what he says it's still, it's still going to be well I don't want it down you know because so like Mr Greenwood said which I'm not disagreeing with him but he doesn't no matter who says what it could be Jesus come and say remove the tree he you know I can argue with Jesus okay. That's cool, but you understand what I'm saying? It, it, I don't know if if it if it will be effective. I'm. I'd like to try. Okay. Yeah, I th yeah. Well, that, that that's a good point too, and I thought about that too. So I don't. We don't want staff to come, and also be um, berated as well. So you know. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, because of that, a new yeah. light or? Yeah, I just wanted to make a response to the tree enthusiasts. Uh, perhaps there's somebody that would vote on, you know, would vote for the tree no matter what, or tie themselves to a tree. But <laughs> what we really need to do is educate people on the value of trees. There's a reason, there are economic incentives why we want to have a healthy canopy. And it's not just aesthetics, although personally I think a yard, a playground, whatever looks a lot better with a shade tree. It's breaking the wind, breaking energy. It's absorbing stormwater. These are storm, they help us manage stormwater. It's the shade which brings down the temperature 10 degrees. And they produce air, which we all pretty much enjoy. So there are, I think a lot of times we found when people come forward that they really don't understand the value of the tree. In fact, we had that one incident where the woman says, wait, I requested you cut it down, but now, now I know, don't, don't cut it down. Um, I mean, we do have a ways to go in terms of shoring up our canopy and um, some of our streets, you know, with the, the way the archways, uh, where the trees were planted too close, or perhaps it was the wrong tree for the wrong place. So that's something we do over time. And hopefully with that grant and, and that plan that they advise, devised for us will help us do that. I, that's why I asked questions, because I wanted to make sure that we were taking those recommendations into account because those are people that have studied the value of trees. So that's all That's all I wanted to point out. All right. Um, I just want to say, just for the record, for this, this instance that we uh, talked about, the two trees, we had one tree where it was proposing possible damage to an infrastructure, uh, a structure, uh, the Heritage Moore. Uh, museum, and then we have one where the tree was rot; it was starting to decay. So either way, you 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 know, there's no saving that tree, and you have to outweigh the damage that it could the other tree that could pot potentially cause. So I, those are good advice for maybe future tree requests, removal requests. 
But I think in this case, we made the right decision here. Uh, it was kind of a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like I said, moving forward, those suggestions that was made, that may work for those instance, instances. But here, I don't see any issue here. So if we don't have any more comments, uh, we'll move on to city manager for reports. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mrs. Jamani, Mrs. Singer, Mrs. Nuderman, um, and Mrs. Bowman. Yes, sir. I just wanted to announce that our summer youth program is starting um, the recruitment process to hire high school students for our um, COCO Works program for over the summer. It's a paid internship, and um, we budgeted for 14 positions in the budget. And we've been working with Coco High they've, and Rockledge High. Um, it's open to all juniors and seniors um, eligible for the program. Um, but we focus on Coco residents. So Coco residents would have first priority. So um, we've met with Coco High a couple times already, and they've promised me that they're going to make it bigger and better this year than ever as far as fill all those slots. So we're um, excited about that. So applications. Um, are open. The due date for the application is April 28th, um, and you can apply online on our website, cocofl.gov slash cocoworks. And um, also, we planned a recruitment event at um, Career Source Brevard, where we're going to have a few of our hiring managers on site interviewing on the spot on uh, March 30th, um, starting at 10 a.m. Um, to 1 p.m. at the Rockledge Career Center on Barnes Boulevard. And um, specifically, they're interviewing for a utility mechanic position, dispatcher, and maintenance worker positions. So um, it's just a new um, program that we're, we're trying with Career Source Brevard to interview on the spot. Um, for entry level positions, and we're hoping that it'll be successful. So, Career Source is partnering with us also on the summer youth program where they help um, with the interns. So, they're a good partner to our city. So, we want to thank them for their help. Um, I just have two quick updates. Um, tomorrow is the deadline for our Upstart Coco program um, applications. So um, if you haven't already, please get those applications in. Um, also wanted to just say that we are planning our Arbor Day event for April 22nd um, in Riverfront Park from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I sent all of you guys an email about the rain barrels. Um, so make sure that if you didn't already, um, please pick up your rain barrels. We'd love to see what you can do with them. <laughs> be creative. We're going to try to get those auctioned off and raise some money for our Coco Pal program to be able to expand their, their community garden. Um, so uh, we will have different events uh, at the Arbor Day event. We're going to have workshops. We'll have a plant sale uh, by the Brevard Discovery Garden. Um, and we're going to have entertainment, food trucks, um, all different types of things. So it should be a very good event. Um, and again, that's April 22nd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Riverfront Park. Um, so I just wanted to remind all of council and everyone else that uh, Orchid Lake is having their groundbreaking ceremony on Thursday, March 16th at 11 a.m. at the site right there off of Michigan Avenue. There's a pretty large sign, you'll be able to see it. Parking will be made available along the, the side of the roadway. They'll, they'll have a, a set up for everybody to park in there, not to park at the Murphy's gas station, please. Uh. Um, that will be the only request that has been made is to not park there and, and walk. If you have to park across the street at the church or park next to the property, you can park there as well. Um, but it should last about an hour and they'll do the groundbreaking. Again, that's for the Orchid Lake Affordable Housing Apartments, 90 units that'll be constructed. They're in the site planning phase or site clearing phase right now and, and underground development. And then they'll be going vertical probably within the next 60 to 90 days. Uh, Mayor Blake. Yes, sir. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Quick question. I know it's a little way. April 1st. Uh, trash bash. Uh, first family promise. And 
and this is another third event we we all been invited to attend. It, it, uh, it's a ribbon cutting. I think it's a ribbon cutting. Some event that we have. Uh, can we talk about? I'm, I'm I'm a little fired up about trash bash from last year. I believe someone stole trash bash because <laughs> I knew we had the greatest number, but that's last year. Bygones, it's friendly competition. Let me help you help you out. Who I'm talking about? Councilman Goins. <laughs> the best. <laughs> so I'm just letting people be aware of it because I know our RTC and even the Boy Scouts participate too as well. Yes, sir. That'll be April 1st, um, 8 a.m. till noon or 1. Um, we have lunch over at Riverfront Park. Um, there will be opportunity for volunteer hours. So if there's anybody that wants to join Team Coco, um, you can reach out to Nadasha Harris. Uh, her number is 321-635-7702 or nharris at cocofl.gov. Uh, she will be happy to give you, assign you a location. We pick up trash in conjunction with with all other municipalities on the same day. It's it's through Keep Brevard Beautiful, um, and all the cities are vying to see who can pick up the most trash. Um, and the city of Coco has been the winner for the last, I don't know, 10 plus years. Um, and so we are uh, on on the board on board to to gain that championship again. Um, and so, yes, we have teams competing for who can recruit the most volunteers and who can pick up the most trash. So um, I believe each member of council got an email that um, outlined kind of what we were looking from council to help recruit some volunteers as well. Okay. And it is on the same day as the family promise, but the family promise ribbon cutting will be a little bit about 1145 to accommodate so you guys can get, get there after the trash bash. And I'm clear where we have one more council meeting for the month of March. I just read the yeah. out there now because uh, I feel slighted, but it's in good fun and good humor. And that's what it's all about because we get people to participate. Uh, and I think uh, Debbie Mayor Hearns made a good statement um, about um, participation. Go ahead. I'm through. Thank you. Uh, any more reports? Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Bowman. Bowman. Yes, Mr. Her. Mayor and Council Members, I'm pleased to um, inform you that the city has once again won the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the GFOA. has won the GFOA Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. And I'd like to thank my staff uh, for their dedicated efforts in helping achieve this goal. Fantastic. Great job, man. Great job. The team of all departments play an intricate part in the spoke of the wheel called success. All Uh, back to the city manager. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, and again, from, from me, congratulations to you, uh, Mrs. Bowman and staff. That is the gold standard for, um, for governmental financial agencies. And so um, she does a good job in pursuit of that each year. Um, and so I've, I've given to you, I've passed out the uh, latest update to the legislative priorities. And I want to draw your attention to uh, number 10. Rebecca, did I give you this? I gave you this. So, so on uh, House Bill uh, 1331 pertains to municipal utilities and uh, virtually affects uh, everything that we do in terms of the general fund transfer from utilities to um, um, to uh, our for our general government purposes, and so this uh, summary comes from the League of Cities there. But just let me try to uh, walk you through it, and I may need some help from uh, Mr. Garganesi and, and uh, Mrs. Bowman there. But it restricts uh, the surcharges uh, to um, customers that are that are uh, outside of the. Uh, of the city limits there, that's capped at 10%. I don't think that that's a that's a huge issue for us, so that's not the biggest one. Uh, secondly, it provides that um, the utility 
would uh, be subject to regulation by the Public Service Commission. Um, and then um, most importantly, it, it uh, prohibits transfers out of that enterprise fund uh, to the general fund and only authorizes those for, um, for public utility purposes. And so as I read that, we would be transferring from utilities to the general fund for utilities associated expenditures. Right now, um, through either the return on investment, through the uh, payment in lieu of taxes, I, I think we have one there, uh, administrative fees and indirect costs, we probably get about 48% of the general fund uh, uh, revenues or general fund funding sources from utilities. This would uh, stop most of that, if not all of that. And so this is uh, that bill that uh, more so for the city of Cocoa is a, uh, is a, uh, detrimental to the general government services that we provide through the resources that we get from utilities. Uh, going on to the last page, it talks about um, how the percentage of the, uh, of the fee is uh, fixed or capped for um, outside versus uh, inside the city customers. And then uh, it talks about the transfer, regardless of whatever amount that is, that transfer from utilities would be subject to local referendum. Um, and, and so whatever utility that, whatever transfer that would uh, be able to occur, again, I don't understand the wisdom of transferring to the general fund to make utility expenditures, but that would have to be approved by the voters there. And I think uh, Mr. Garganese, if I remember correctly, that's an annual uh, referendum requirement. I'm, I'm not sure if I remember, I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, and, and again, the last one says that you can't transfer for to the general fund for non-public utility purposes. So, so, and if you do so, you're not eligible for uh, any sort of state funds for infrastructure projects or water related projects there. So again, uh, and we've talked about this from um, day one of my tenure, how dependent we are on the, uh, the resources of the utility uh, enterprise fund. And so this, this in essence is, a, is a something that is very detrimental to the city because you can't recruit those even if you were to uh, if you even if you were able to go up to the 10 mil cap, it still doesn't bring you enough to replace the revenue that's lost from uh, what we get from utilities. And so, uh, obviously, we have that on your listing of priorities as a as a a, a recommendation to be in a opposition to this uh, to this house bill. And so, if I've missed anything, Mr. Garganese or, or Mrs. Bowman. I know at the Space Coast League of Cities, we discussed that. Um, as you can see, the economic impact that it would have on the city of Copa and other municipalities. And my thing is, we, we try to be awesome uh, stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, um, keeping our millage rate compatible within Bavaria County. But it's imperative that we reach out to our state legislatures this coming, um, what's that, uh, April 2nd, 3rd, and 4th when we travel up to Tallahassee. Um, I just want to make sure we do make that connection. And I know we are, we reserve time and dates to meet with our elected officials, our state legislatures. So knowledge is power. And I'm asking the citizens uh, to also look at House Bill 1331, and there's a few others. Senate Bill 130 and 170. Okay. Is there anything else, Mr. City Manager? Yeah, and, and again, just, and I've said this before, I, I got a question recently uh, with regards to why I always focus in on on the uh, significance of, of uh, the utility revenue, and this is, this is one of those reasons because, you know, in the city of Cocoa, uh, not only is that approaching half of our general fund resources, in the city of Cocoa, approximately half 
of the residential uh, properties, taxable properties, have a taxable value of less than $50,000. And so what that equates to in terms of the simple math is between 300 and 350, maybe $400 uh, a year that you get in revenues from over half of the of the residential taxable parcels there. That That is, uh, that is very different, very unique, I think, to the city of Cocoa. And so this is, I can't overstate how significant this bill is and how detrimental it would be to the city of Cocoa. Well, we have to be proactive, construct, build, both residential and commercial, enhance our tax base. Okay, sir, anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, any more reports? City Attorney? Uh, no report. All right, moving on to Council. I believe we are evens today. Um, Councilwoman Coss? I think it went first last time. Oh, okay. Well, Councilman Goins? Yeah, I'm good. Cool. I'm good. Oh. Not even, you are. Hmm? Oh. oh, that's yo. Well, he's in charge. Oh, no. you the man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We went even last week. I right, Councilman Goins. Um, but before we do the uh, photo slide and the slides, I, I want to get a consensus from uh, council, something that we'd like to um, have our city manager either look into or bring back to us. Uh, Pastor Jarvis Watts reached out to me today regarding um, his Friday night um, team nights or uh, young, younger, I don't know what, it, what you call them, teens, elementary, middle school, high school. Um, so every Friday night for the last probably 10 years or so, uh, he's hosted four to 500 uh, kids um, at Jolie Smith Center. It used to be at the old center, now it's in the new center. Um, and so the county charges him um, roughly twelve to $1,600 every Friday um, for eight weeks. He used to do it for uh, 14 weeks, but it just costs way too much so he has to pay the 12 to 1600 dollars and also they require him to get police as well um, to help with some of the security um so he he just asked me a question hey what can you think the city would like to partner with me because we all know fridays in the summertime is really it it, it helps our police department with a lot of issues um throughout the community if, if there's nothing for the kids to do we all know what's going to happen and so he's asking for a partnership, whatever that may be, uh, from the city. It doesn't have to be monetary, um, but it could just be a partnership where um, he, go, he goes underneath us for a partnership, which it will lower some of his costs. Um, either way, he's going to have to get police, so that's a cost that's fixed. Um, so we will not even ask him for that, but maybe we can partner with him. Um, would y'all be interested in our city manager bringing that back um, just for just to see where he's you know once he makes the proposal and, and we see what he what he wants and so I just want to throw that at y'all. Mm -hmm. Everybody okay uh, with problem with it? Is, like I say, coordinating through the city manager. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> eight. The city attorney. Make yep. sure we get it. Yeah, it's eight weeks. Okay. Um, so, so these last uh, two weeks, two and a half weeks, has been very exciting. A lot of things going on. Um, so this event, uh, thank you to um, our city manager and Samantha for coming and helping me in this event at McNair Middle School. Um, the second year going to speak at their civics class. Um, and so the, that's Mr. Washburg on the far left, some of the kids. Uh, I know I feel real old because most of these kids, I went to school with their <laughs> parents so i felt really bad all day um but um so it was it was a good thing because we all know that local government is is very very important to the lives of of, of the people um so this was a hey blue event that we talked about earlier um a lot of good conversation um and a lot of solutions was made and appreciate the uh, police department um for stepping up and being open-minded um the fbc leo annual event um on the left, that's not uh, our mayor yelling at somebody. He was he was speaking uh, at our event, so we really appreciate him and also all the other elected officials uh, throughout the state of Florida 
Uh, it was a great event, great experience, always good to hear uh, some of the issues and a lot of the positives and different programs that other cities have uh, that we can possibly bring to the city of Coco. So great, great event and kudos to FBC Leo for hosting the event. Um, so it, it, again, you know, we appreciate everybody for just paying attention today and, and, and being here and, and being involved in city government. Um, you could be anywhere else. And, you know, I just speak going back to the, uh, trash badge. It's a lot of, I've been getting a lot of phone calls the last couple of days dealing with, uh, some trash in the city. Um, why is this? Why is that? They're complaining, but trash badge, it could be opportunity for anyone who has complaints about what the city is not doing to come out and be a part of that solution. And so we're asking for anyone to come out that April 1st, um, you know, spend three or four hours with us out in the community. And it, it could also help people uh, appreciate um, their community by other folks getting out there cleaning up. It'll make them feel guilty too. So that's one thing I did learn. Sometimes when you're cleaning up the neighborhood and going in people's yards, picking up beer bottles, um, then next thing you know, they are outside with you cleaning up. So um, I hope everyone can come out April 1st to, um, to to that event. So I'm done. Oh, yeah. So April 1st, um, it is from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. I think it ends around 12 uh, are they doing lunch as well this year? Yeah, lunch in Riverfront Park. Yep. Is that Chick Fil A? I think it is. I don't know. I thought it was hot dogs. I thought the police. Well, I'm gonna say Chick Fil A. Maybe that'll get more people. Uh, well, well uh, yeah, yeah. Well, ain't it trying to encourage people? Uh, so yeah, so you know, we want again, we want everyone to, to come out again. We know we have some issues in certain parts of the community that we need to clean up. We know that. Uh, we don't, we can't hide from it. It's, it's just, it's part of the game. But again, it's no point of just complaining about it. We need to get out and do something about it. So I hope to see you there. Thank you. All righty, uh, Councilman Dow. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh. What you say? If you see that's the new sign of the Integra Trails, they are running apartments out. They got two buildings pretty well full, and they're working on the third one now. The uh, that's the main entrance for the uh, office, the break room, the pool room. I got other pictures. All right, this is uh, as you walk in the lobby wow. while you're waiting. Clubhouse. There's the swimming pool. It's got a cooking area. It's got fire pits. The gymnasium they have for their clients is amazing. I mean, it's got everything you want. It's also got a yoga room as well. This is the uh, game room and also the kitchenette. You're going to have a party or not. Uh, pool tables, air hockey. It's, it's amazing what they've done. And they also have a uh, computer room. So if you want to go over and uh, do some work and like that, they'll have all the stuff in there. They haven't got the printers and stuff in there, but they will uh, as part of the computer room as well. They even have, if you live in the apartment complex and you're working from home, you have a conference area for clients. There's their office that they, uh, you sign the lease with. This is the one bedroom apartment with 10 foot ceilings. I'm on the first floor. All apartments have 10 foot ceilings. That's the little living room they have. You know, they did a really nice job uh, staging it. Be master bedroom, that's a king size bed. Comes, they all come with washers and dryers, big walk-in closets. That's going from the master bedroom to the bathroom. Uh, this, I believe, is the uh, two-bedroom apartment. Yep, that's the two-bedroom. Uh, larger kitchen, larger uh, living room, two baths. Comes again, this is a side-by-side -side washer and dryer, walk-in closets, a double sink. This is the uh, dog park. Uh, like I say, they've really done a nice job over there. Uh, and they're filling up fast. And uh, I'm really impressed with it. Like I say, when I walked in and saw the 10 foot ceilings, I've never seen that in an apartment complex before. You know, when I was, me and my wife first got married, we lived in apartments and they weren't very big and they weren't very nice. So that's all I have. All right.
right, moving on to Councilwoman Coffs. Okay. That button right there. The one in the middle? Right inside, yeah. Well, I just have a couple things. Um, let's see. So there's District 4, but I um, wanted to talk about this because this is a $27 million investment that the enterprise, the, um, what do they call it? The, uh, they do the, what do they call it? Sun, Sun Pass. Sun Pass Enterprise uh, is making a $27 million investment and it just happens to be the area right around Coco. So just to let you know this is going in, it's going to be a communication system upgrade, lighting upgrade. Um, this is going to help with the road weather information. Um, it's going to help with traffic overall. It's going to help with, um, you know, when we have evacuation. I'm hoping that they don't have in mind that we're going to have toll roads. They can't do it. <laughs> they can't do it in Brevard, right? That's right. But at any rate, um, they're making this investment right on our, right on our border there. So uh, that should help with safety as well. And it's going to happen relatively soon during my lifetime. <laughs> so, um, and Greg mentioned this earlier but I wanted to talk a little bit more about it. Um, this was, I, I believe this was a federal grant to do this resiliency and they did it with the Eastern Central Florida Planning Council um, using metrics to determine, you know, where we stand. Th these are the COCO stats, where we stand in the risk factors. Um, and they talked about, it's all in terms of shocks versus stressors an example of a stressor would be poverty. If an area has poverty, it's harder to come back. Um, in this case, in regard to streets, a stressor might be might be flooding, whereas you know a shock would be a, a fire or a, a, a storm. Um, sea level rise might be more of a, a stressor, shoreline erosion more of a stressor. But wanted to point out that in the study they did, they really didn't give us anything cocoa, any percentage in terms of storm surge, sea level rise, or shoreline erosion. And that's because it didn't take into account Indian River Drive, because that's not functionally classified um, for this particular study. And um, we know, of course, that we have storm surge on Indian River Drive will experience some sea level rise and, and we're also experiencing erosion. Um, but the flooding, of course, that applies to all the other areas. Um, and wildlife is an issue, fire and wildlife is an issue, particularly as we have the apartments going up on 524 with all of the conservation area behind it. Um, that uh, is susceptible to fires. Now, I also wanted just to put this on everybody's radar screen, the Performing Arts in District 4. This is a real resource for us, Simpkins Fine Arts Center. Um, and what's so great about this is, in addition to the students at Eastern Florida, it also includes a lot of our community members. Um, got numerous neighbors that are involved in these events, and um, it's a great opportunity to enjoy some of this um, entertainment um, for free. So um, put those dates on your calendar. And that's all I've got. All righty. Uh, okay. Uh, Mayor Blake. I'm short and sweet. I, got, I have a few things here that I would like to share. I'm um, like everyone else. We've been extremely busy attending a multitude of different functions. 
May, arranging from when we were at the Black Caucus, uh, FBC Leo. I'm happy to say that there was a young lady from Bavard County, she's a Bavardian, by the name of Ann Janney Sharma. She was involved with a um, writing um, event pertaining to the correlation between affordable housing and homelessness. She won that award, this grant writing event, and uh, she's from Bavard County, a student of, that's not her, uh, this is one of the mayors from the local cities, municipalities. Um, but um, Mrs. Anjani Sharma was the recipient of this $1,000 award that uh, Councilman Gons and Deputy Mayor uh, Hearn and I attended. Kudos to one of our two, uh, many outstanding Bavardians, also Coca High graduates. Uh, Mr. Jamel Dean just recently was reassigned uh, in agreement with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and also wanted Taylor. He's now with the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm happy to say, and they both, um, yes, sir, they're being paid handsomely and rewardingly because they put forth a positive effort and through their uh, skills and talents, it's paying off but more so than anything else, their prayers for these young men. Yes, sir. So kudos to those two gentlemen. Uh, there was a video that I was trying to share with uh, Councilman Goins at the Black History, um, uh, I, I guess we weren't able to get it because it's a YouTube, but I got it. <laughs> I have wherever I can get it, uh, once we, uh, uh, fix this unique shortcoming, um, and we will be, Mr. Beach and his staff, for asking that, uh, where a young man portrayed Councilman Gorman, and he did a phenomenal job. So kudos to everyone. Again, uh, please get involved with the Trash Bass. Happy St. Patrick's Day, and happy Pi Day. And last but not least, our fearless leader, Deputy Mayor, <laughs> Lavender. Uh, I don't have much. Uh, I've, I've attended most of these events that the other council members and the mayor spoke of. Uh, a lot of great, great things going on. Um, looking forward to the trash bash. Uh, also, if I put my fire cap on for a second, it's extremely dry out right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would ask citizens be careful with you know burning, burning anything right now. Uh, keep an eye on your, your brush in your backyards and. Uh, if you see any smoke fire, report it as soon as possible. Um, and that's all. Again, congratulations to uh, Mr. Neely Dunn. And also, um, thank you, Mr. City Manager, for those House Bill 1331, but also Senate Bill 130 and 170 that uh, Esquire Garganisi will come back and present to us. It's pertaining to a public hearing and having to uh, make certain preparations. Okay. The chair entertains a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? Great. Right, you have it.